morning. We welcome you in Jesus' name to our service today. We're glad that you're together with us. Uh, this is June 14th. It's actually Flag Day in America, but we've come to worship the Lord together, and we're thankful that you have come together with us. Let's begin today by doing a responsive reading. It's number two in our hymnal. It's entitled Creation. And so I'm going to read responsively uh, with my family here today. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And, and the, the earth, earth was, was without form and void, and darkness, darkness was upon the face, face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God created every living creature that moveth after his kind. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply in the earth. And it was so. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. God bless the reading of his word. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of being together. We thank you for each person that has gathered together here in my family and those who will gather together uh, via the Internet. We're thankful, Lord God, that we can connect online and we pray Lord God that you would bless this time together we pray that you would be worshipped and adored in this time may your word go forth with truth and power and may we uh, be changed because we have interacted with it and believed it Lord bless this time now together by your Holy Spirit in Jesus name we pray amen the first song we're going to sing is a, a well known song in the, in the church it's called joyful joyful we adore thee Thank you for that good singing. Today I'd like to uh, 
read from the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to read the creation story. There are actually two creation stories. Chapter 1 has one, and chapter 2 has a second one. It's more focused on uh, the creation of Adam and Eve. But chapter 1 gives us the six days of creation. So let's read it together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, firmament rather, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament and of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures And let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures, creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields fruit, or every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your word, and we pray today as we 
as we worship you, we pray that, Lord, you might be blessed to be honored because you are the great creator of all things. And I pray that as we consider this passage of scripture again today, we pray, Lord God, that you would bless it to our hearts, that we might be reminded of this fundamental truth once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. About 95 years ago, uh, 1925 to be exact, in the United States, it was a law, and specifically in the state of Tennessee, it was a law that only when we dealt with the origin of everything, only creation could be taught in the public school. And what happened was a man named John Scopes went to trial. In fact, it's a well-known trial. It's called the Scopes Monkey Trial, where he was uh, brought to trial because he had taught evolution in the school. And ultimately, he was convicted and sentenced for that. But ever since that time, since about 1925, there has been a reversal in the American culture. Now, instead of that only creation can be taught and evolution shouldn't be entered into, now it's the other way around, that really only evolution should be taught in the public school and not creation. In the year 2004, I was asked by one of my assistant principals at the school I was teaching at at the time to teach a couple of sections of biology. And the textbook that I used in that class, when it dealt with the origin of everything, only had evolution. There was nothing said about creation at all. Now, I uh, said to my class, when we got to that section, I said, there are really two views of how the world came to be. There's the evolutionary view and there's the creationist view. Now, you understand the evolutionary view is really comes about from Charles Darwin and the, reading, the book called The Origin of the Species. And in his book, he basically espouses this, that nobody did it. Nobody did it when it came to what is all around us, that this all came about by spontaneous generation. There is no intelligent force behind it. There is no intelligent design. It all came about by chance. Now, if you studied old ancient uh, understandings of how the world was, specifically the Babylonians, they, they say that the physical universe was eternal and that the gods came about, they were created by the universe and the people in the universe. But as we look at the scriptures, we recognize that it's really turned the other way around. That we understand that God himself is eternal and that the universe was created by him. God is superior then to the physical world. So even today in my culture, American culture today, we have people who scoff at anyone who believes anything but evolution. I remember even one of the presidential candidates was scoffed at because he believed in creation and didn't believe evolution. Well, let me state with, uh, with all that I have that I believe what the Bible has to say, that the Bible is true in all of its understanding of creation, and that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not a myth, as someone might suppose, but they are, in fact, the way things are, that God did it. And so if you want to know what the title of my message today is, it's simply God did it. God did it. And I have four things I want to say as we look at the passage of Scripture today. The first thing is that God did it with his power. God did it with his power. Uh, there are ten different times in this text, in Genesis chapter 1, where it said, and God said, for example, in verse 2, uh, verse 3 rather, it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. The first element in all creation was light. But ten different times God says it. Now, he doesn't always create when he said it. He had a conversation with Adam and Eve there at the end of chapter 1. But when God said it, it happened. In olden days, and hopefully still today, when, when a man and another man were going to make a deal, say someone said, I'm going to build something for you, and he said, I'm going to do it, that a man's word uh, was good. If a man said he would do it, then that meant he was going to do it. And if he didn't, he would be not true to his word. 
We want to be truthful. But here in the scripture, in Genesis chapter 1, we recognize that not only is God's word good, but that God's word is what makes it happen. God didn't have to do anything except speak the word, and the worlds came into being. God did it with his power. Secondly, let me say this, that God did it in an orderly fashion. God did it in an orderly fashion. We were just discussing in our family about how we name the days of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, etc. But in the beginning, as God created the world, God simply had Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, describe it as the first day, the second day, up to the first six days. Now, we didn't read about the seventh day, but you know in the first few verses of chapter 2, God rested on the seventh day from all he had done. And so the whole idea of how we have a week, how we function in our culture, how we function really as people in a weekly kind of cycle, that it's all set up because of how God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. God did it in six days. I would say that Genesis chapter 1 is a great example of understatement. Understatement meaning we don't have all the intricacies of what God did described for us in Genesis chapter 1. We have the broad scoping picture. God draws this huge picture of how he brought the world to be. In fact, one of the, one of the funny things that's stated here in chapter 1 is this. It says in verse uh, 15, and he, Let them be for lights and firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Verse 16 says, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. That's the sun and the moon. And then this little sentence, He made the stars also. You know how many stars there are? Someone has estimated there's about a trillion stars for every person on the face of the earth. So uh, there are seven billion of us or so here on the face of the earth. And for every one of us, God has about a trillion lights. And all that God says in Genesis chapter 1 is he made the stars also. That's certainly understatement. God did it in an orderly fashion. I'm intrigued by when we think about some of the creation that we have before us. I'm going to use a couple of illustrations. One is the idea of of, um, birds. How are birds able to fly? Evolutionists and those that are atheists have no way of explaining this. In fact, um, what we know is that feathers on a bird are, are highly complex, and there are intricate designs that are necessary so that birds can fly. And how did the intricacy of those feathers come about so that birds learned how to fly? Well, obviously the Creator made it that way so they could fly. I was thinking about another animal, and maybe you've had this animal in your neighborhood. Uh, They're pretty prevalent here in southwest Florida. It's called a woodpecker. And uh, for most of us, woodpeckers are an irritant because they somehow destroy things in our house, especially if our house is made out of wood. I know that when I was in construction that we would oftentimes replace wood with some other material so that the woodpeckers wouldn't get to it. But imagine what it's like for a woodpecker If we think about the evolutionary process that somehow that the woodpeckers evolved into what they are today, what was it like for a woodpecker before he developed a shock absorber? Think about it. When a woodpecker uses, he uses his beak in order to knock holes in the wood so that he can get inside and get to the bugs inside there. But imagine what it was like for him before he ever had a shock absorber that he developed in his head. Well, he wouldn't have survived, right? After the first few pecks, he would have been dead. The other thing about a woodpecker is this, that a woodpecker has, behind its ear, he has a long tongue, and the tongue retracts behind its ear. But then when when he needs to, he can stick that tongue way out and go way inside a tree or whatever he pecks into in order to get the bugs inside. Now, what was it like before the woodpecker's tongue was longer than it is now? What if it was a short tongue? Would he have died of not having an ability to get to the animals that he was trying to eat? 
the bugs that he was trying to eat? Do you get my point? My point is this. If all of these evolutionary things happened, if these animals somehow uh, went along the way to be where they are today, they never would have survived. And so when they were initially designed by God, they were designed with all the things that they needed in order to survive, including for a woodpecker, the shock absorber on his beak, so that he doesn't basically blow his brains out. And secondly, this, this long tongue so that he can reach all the way in to get the bugs that he needs to eat. God, when he designed the world, he did it, and he did it in an orderly fashion. Thirdly, I'd like to say this, that God did it, and it was very good. It was very good. Now, why do I say that? Well, I mentioned before that God had said, when God spoke, it happened. And in verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, it says, and God said. And when God said it, it happened. Now, not only is that phrase repeated in the book of Genesis chapter 1, but there's another phrase that's repeated several times. Let me make reference to it. It's in verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25. It says this in verse 10. And God called the, the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. And that, that phrase is repeated several times. I mentioned the verses it's repeated in. So when God created this thing, he looked back and he said, this is good. This is good. Have you ever made anything, whether it's something in the kitchen that you may have cooked or something that you've built, and you look back after you've made it and you say, yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, the amazing thing about something is that we don't ever really create something. We take things that are already existing and we put them together in order to make something else, whether it's a cake in the kitchen or what it might be, whether it's a, I just made some cornhole things for a game uh, that we play in the backyard, but it was made out of wood that was already created. My kids took paint and painted it, but it was out of, Materials that were put together in order to make the color of the paint. God took nothing and made something out of it. God made it himself. And every time God made it, God said it was good. Now, there is a summary statement, and it's the last verse in chapter 1. And this is what it said. And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed... It was very good. So not only did God give the commentary on his work that it was good, it says that God saw that it was good, and God saw everything he had made in the last verse of chapter 1, and indeed it was very good. It wasn't just good, it was very good. We might say it was excellent, it was beyond excellent, it was superior to anything, because God made it. And God made it very good. All right, so how does that apply to you and me specifically? Well, part of that creation was the creation of mankind. That God made us in his own image. We're going to get to that in a minute. And who we are, since God made it very good, that we're very good. Not that we don't have sin, not that we don't have issues with ourselves. And that's part of uh, the chapter 3 of Genesis, that we fell into sin in the fall. But... Regarding who we're made, David described it this way in Psalm 139. He said, Behold, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and my soul knows that very well. That God did it in a miraculous way, and God did it, and when he did it, it was very good. So we've said, first of all, that God did it with his power. We've said that God did it in an orderly fashion. And thirdly, God did it, and it was very good. The fourth thing I want to mention here is this, that God did it, with man at the apex of his creation. God did it with man at the apex of his creation. When I use the term apex, if you've built anything in your life, uh, especially on your house, and you put your roof together uh, at the top of the roof, the top of the roof is the apex. It's the top part of your roof. 
And when we think about God's creation, when we come to the very top of his creation, and I'm not saying this proudly, I'm saying this as a matter of what God actually said, that man was at the apex. And how do we know that? Because when we get to the text here, certainly you've heard this before, listen to what God said in verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let us make man in our image. By the way, if you understand the Trinity, the Trinity is first depicted to us, it's first hinted at here in this very first conversation that God has with himself. It doesn't say, God doesn't say, let me make man in my image. It's not singular, it's plural. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. And so when we think about mankind, according to our likeness, God said, and then he said, let, uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So in understanding what God said about man, there are two things about us that are really unique. First of all, that we are the only created thing that's made in the image of God. Now, evolutionists would try to say we, we, you know, we evolved from monkeys, and we have a lot of similarities with the monkeys. Well, certainly we do. They have hands like we have. We have they have feet like we do. But the reality is this, that God used the same kind of great design to design other animals, but in the greatest of his designs, that is humankind, God made us in his image. There are no other animals that are made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? That's a, another whole sermon in itself. But the idea that we are the image of God and that we have, we have a soul that can communicate with God that we have the ability to live forever so that when we are created, we are an immortal soul. And after this life, there will be another life that we enter into, whether it's eternal life with God in heaven or eternal damnation in hell, apart from him. So we are the only actual being that lives forever. Someone has said it this way, you know, birds and dogs don't make churches. They don't build churches in order to worship God. We're the only beings that build something in order that we might adore and worship the Creator. So we are made in the image of God. God stamped His image on us. The second thing about us that puts us at the apex is that God said, let them have dominion. And then He lists a short list of all the other created things the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That includes the, you know, the, uh, the bugs that come into your house that you try to get rid of. God gave us dominion over all those things. So we have the ability to basically oversee and supervise and manage the rest of the world. Now, we haven't always done the best at that. Sometimes we've abused creation. But God did give us dominion. That is, we are at the apex of his creation. So let's go on, see what it says here. Verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So the whole understanding of who we are as human beings and the whole idea of our gender, male and female, that God created that because that was in his image. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So this was in a direct command to Adam and Eve. Now, they're not mentioned as Adam and Eve in chapter 1. We recognize that in chapter 2. But the command that God gives to them is he blessed them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc., 
So what does God do? God gives them the, the responsibility and the command to go and have more of themselves, to reproduce, to be fruitful. Be fruitful means to have children and to multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it so that man's place is a place of dominion over all creation. Now, um, if you read chapter 1 there, verse 29 says, I've given you every herb. Uh, initially, mankind, we were not carnivores. I guess you call them, we were herbivore. We were simply eating fruit and vegetables. That's all we ate. And it wasn't until after the, after the flood that man became a carnivore that we ate other animals. But what we have is um, God giving that all to mankind to eat. And then God, in the next verse, gives it to all the birds and all the other animals that they can eat, herbs and vegetables and fruit as well. And so everything that ever lived on the face of the earth at the beginning of creation, they were all, in essence, vegetarian. And then after the fall, then animals began to eat other animals. And that's the way it is today. But God, in the beginning, created man at the apex of his creation. All right, so what do we see here? We find in the first chapter this particular truth that needs to be reiterated today. And it really is a foundational truth of all God's word. And that is that God did it. God created all things. In fact, the summary statement there in the very first verse of the Bible is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the foundation. And when we believe that, that is the foundation for everything else. And if we don't believe that, then it's hard to believe all the other things that God has done. So let's once again state with uh, all that we have and state emphatically that the Bible is true in everything that it says specifically what it says about creation, that God was the one that put it all together. And God did it, and he did it very well. I pray that the, the understanding that God is a creator, God is the creator, would be emblazed on your heart this week. I just had a conversation this week with someone that I was working with, and he was talking about God. And he basically said, well, we look at creation. Well, uh, Psalm 19 says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. So creation demonstrates the glory of God. But the glory that we have is this. Later in Psalm 19, it says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, that this God who described, is described as a creator is also a personal God and his name is Jehovah and we can know him personally. And so I pray that this God that created the world might not just be the creator, but he might be one who is also your Savior and Lord, that you've come to know him as Savior and Lord in your life, and know him personally, not just as creator, but know him in a relationship with Jesus Christ, because he has died for our sins. So God bless you as you look at this passage. I pray that you would read it through yourself. Be encouraged to know that God is the creator and let us know that he is interested in us and he has placed us on this world for a special purpose, to have dominion over all things and then to be a reflection of his character because we have his image in us. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the joy of knowing that God created all things. And let us not forget, let us not succumb to what the world wants to tell us about how the world came to be. Let us recognize the, the truth of your word. And I pray, Lord God, that it would help us understand who we are and the place we have in your creation. Help us to recognize that, Lord, and to rejoice in who you are in all that you've done in creating us in such a glorious way. Bless this word to our hearts then today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of more songs now together. Uh, the first song we're going to sing is called Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
number 460. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all also going to sing a song that may not be as familiar to you, uh, but it's entitled, I Know Whom I Have Believed. I Know Whom I Have Believed. And let's sing verses 1, 2, five, uh, 4, and 5. 1, 2, 4, and 5. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me good singing. Let's join together in a word of prayer. 
Our Father and our God, we thank you for this word today to our hearts. We thank you that our God is the one who created it all. And we rejoice once again in the foundational truth that all that has ever come to be, all that is here today, is here because you created it. And we pray, Lord God, that we may rejoice in you as our creator. And I pray in a personal way that all, all of us would also rejoice in you as our redeemer, because you have paid the cost for our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank you for that truth today. Lord God, I would pray today that you might be blessed and honored and glorified in this time. And I pray, Lord God, that you would meet the needs of those around us. Lord, you know the needs that we have mentioned numerous times in our church. For the people who are sick, I would pray specifically today for Art Ray. and I pray for him as he continues through his chemo treatment. Bless him, Lord God. I pray for Mary Langley as she continues to recover from her accident this spring. Lord God, I pray for uh, Dio Seibel. Bless him, Lord, as he re continues to recover from his surgery as well. And Lord, you know the other needs. Uh, we pray today, Lord God, for Kenny uh, Finley. We thank you for him, and we pray you'd touch upon his life. We pray that you'd strengthen him day by day. I would pray today for our neighbor as well, for Christine Jacobson, who lost her husband just a week ago. And Lord God, I pray that you would minister to their heart and life. Lord God, I thank you for uh, how you've worked in Jack and Barb Artman's life. We thank you that they were able to make it safely up to Michigan. And as they move into a new home, uh, I pray, Lord God, that you would help them. And I pray that there may be, uh, they may be surrounded by people who help them in their need. Strengthen them day by day. And we pray that you would bless um, Barb's sister Charlene as she takes care of her and, and her daughter Melody as well. Lord God, we thank you today that you hear our prayers. I would pray today for the Caleros, our missionaries. We thank you for their life, and we pray your blessing over them. We pray that you'd strengthen them as they minister in El Salvador. Bless little baby Emma today as well. Lord God, we can't end our worship service today without praying for our country. We know that there is great need in our country right now. We pray that there may be... Uh, uh, in, in the sense of public discourse, there may be truth and clarity, Lord God, that those that report the news might not incite more violence or might not might misconstrue the things that are, are actually going on. And I pray, Lord God, that there would be discourse between those that are at odds, Lord God, so there may be a reconciliation of the issues that we are facing in our country. Lord God, I pray for your guidance. Lord, that your grace and your peace would be at work in the lives of people and that by the blood of Christ there may be reconciliation between opposing uh, forces. Lord God, bless our country. May we, may we turn to you, God, in this time of crisis. May we find in you a refuge and a strength and you being a very present help in this time of trouble. Pray for our president today, for the Supreme Court. We pray for the Congress of the United States. We pray for Governor DeSantis of Florida and the governors throughout our country. Uh, we pray for uh, the mayor of Cape Coral, uh, Mayor Coviello. We pray for the mayor of Fort Myers, Mayor Henderson. And Lord, all those who have to make decisions uh, regarding the coronavirus, regarding what's going on with the unrest and the, the uh, protests that are going on. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring about peace that you'd bring about restoration, Lord, and you'd bring, uh, that you would bring your grace would cover us. Thank you, Lord God, that we can bring these requests before you, and we, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Receive the benediction, and we'll sing the doxology. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, O creatures here below. Hallelujah.
것이든지 